All right, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to um, this month's non-farm payrolls webinar with me, Michael Hewson, on Friday, the 7th of April, 2023. And this Good Friday. And it's going to be, I think it's going to be one of those numbers that is probably going to not be particularly instructive when it comes to the market reaction. Um, an awful lot of the markets are closed today. And the ones that are open will be closing very shortly after the numbers are released. So I can't stress this strongly enough. Be very careful if you're looking to trade any of these moves that come about as a result of today's numbers. The reason I say that is because US markets, which are currently trading on our platform, will be closing or will cease pricing at 2.15 UK time, just over an hour from now. Um, just for future reference, if you wanna find out the trading hours of a particular instrument, just go to this option here and then select product overview. And that then gives you the trading hours at the bottom there. So you've got midnight British summer time till 14.15 for the trading hours for the NASDAQ. On FX, we're also closing pricing down early as well, in line with our peers and our competitors. Again, 16.15 UK time, so that's 4.15, and that's three hours from now. So unless you're happy with running something over the weekend, just be very nimble if you do decide to trade what markets that are open this afternoon. So um, the numbers, right, We, where do I start? I'll tell you what we're expecting. We're expecting a number of 230,000, um, which will be down from the 311,000 that we saw in February. But since those February numbers were released, the market has moved on quite considerably in terms of what to expect from the Federal Reserve over the course of the next six to nine months. The banking crisis has really, I think, changed the picture when it comes to expectations over Fed rate rises. And that's really borne out in this two year yield chart. Um, prior to the um, collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank, US two-year yields were well above 5%. Obviously, the fallout of that, the bailout of Silicon Valley Bank by JP Morgan or the takeover of Silicon Valley Bank's by assets by JP Morgan and HSBC and what have you, um, the picture has significantly shifted. And the big question now is whether or not this banking crisis, as it is, is going to be considered transitory in terms of the short-term effects on the market, or whether it will have significantly lasting effects on the US economy. And I would suggest it will have effects, tightening of lending standards from uh, banks will inevitably bleed through into the US economy. But prior to obviously the events of the last four weeks, there had been an expectation that the US economy was actually doing all right. January retail sales bounced back strongly by 3%. Headline inflation is coming down, but core prices are very, very sticky. Um, case in point, we've got US CPI next Wednesday. And obviously we've had today's, we've got today's payrolls report. But let's just do a quick pricey of what we've seen so far this week. We've seen a disappoint well, we've seen markets react to the disappointing economic data this week, starting with ISM manufacturing. So, headline number came in at 46.3, which obviously is below 50, it's in contraction territory. Obviously, that's bad manufacturing in contraction, that's bad for the US economy. It's a negative, it suggests that the Fed tightening is having a significant effect on the US economy. Well, actually, you know, I take issue with that interpretation because manufacturing has been struggling globally for the last six months. It's not just the US. If you look at if you look in Europe, um, we're seeing sub 50 manufacturing PMIs. 
So nothing new in that. It's been struggling since November, and yet since November the Fed has hiked rates twice. So what about prices paid? Well, that's slipped to 49.2, so slightly disinflationary. The employment component of the manufacturing ISM, that was disappointing, 44.3. If we look at services, services has been doing that much better. And this is, I think, for me, where the key test lies. Now, the ISM services number for um, March came in at 51.2, um, which, again, it's, it's not a bad number. It's not a great, no, it's not a great number either. Um, but services has been strong for the last 12 months, except for December, um, when it dropped to 49.6 as a consequence of the cold weather um, during that month. Prices paid, it's, it's, it's still quite high at 59.5, dropping from 65.6. And employment is still an expansion of charity, 51.3 to 54. Obviously, we had the ADP payrolls report, that was 145. That missed expectation, expectations, um, but ADP's missed expectations before. It was at 106 in January when um, non-farm payrolls was at 503. So it's, there isn't a particularly good correlation between the two. Then you've got the job openings. Um, that, those came in below expectations, dropped below 10 million for the first time since May 2021, but it's still trending well above the levels it was pre-pandemic. So I would argue that yes, we are seeing a slowdown in the US economy, and certainly there are pockets of weakness. but you know, are we slowing down as a result of um, a significant tightening of credit conditions? Or are we seeing just a bit of a slowdown as a consequence of an overhiring during the pandemic? And now that that effect is starting to rebalance out. Weekly jobless claims was a little bit concerning. Yesterday, that jumped to 228. Um, which was well above expectations. But I think what was slightly more worrying there was that the previous four weeks were also revised up from below 200,000. They were around about 190 to 195. And they were all revised up to well over 225, 230 and 240. So there's some significant upward revisions of 30 to 40,000 a week um, for the last three or four weeks. Now that could be as a consequence of obviously events that took place in March, the collapse of those small regional US banks, and an awful lot of uncertainty as a consequence of that. So the big question I'm going to put to you is if, if we get a good payrolls report, will it make that much difference to market expectations of a potential Fed rate cut later this year? Because ultimately, that is what markets are looking to price. They've made up their minds, the markets. You can see that in the way the two-year yield has collapsed. We've gone from five to three and a half, back to 4.2, and now are at 3.85. So in the space of four weeks, we've gone from pricing one or two more Fed rate hikes to one or two Fed rate cuts, which is right. I suspect the truth is somewhere in between, and today's payrolls numbers probably won't make that much difference. If they're a good set of payrolls numbers, you'll probably see a little bit of a spike higher in the dollar. Euro dollar will go down. But ultimately, I think we are much closer to the end of the Fed's rate hiking cycle than we were four weeks ago. At the very, I think at the very least, we can probably expect another 25 basis point rate hike on the 3rd of May. If we get a poor number, then all that will happen there is we'll get a sharp drop in US two year yields. And it would, I think, a poor number will just reconfirm the market's bias that the Fed will need to cut rates later this year. Now, I don't buy that narrative. I don't think the Fed will be cutting rates this year, but the market has made up its mind that this deterioration in the data could well be sustained. And as a, as a consequence of that, the Fed will be forced to cut. Well, that assumes that inflation starts to return to target. So let's look at that. 5.6% is currently what core CPI is out of the US. So we've got an inflation target of 2%. The Fed's own expectations are for the unemployment rate to be at 4.5% by the end of this year. It's currently 3.6%. And we're in April. Well, we're in March. Well, we're in April, but we're looking at March. 
So by the Fed's own targets, they expect the unemployment rate to rise by almost 1% between now and the end of the year. They expect that to happen. And Powell said at the last set of at the, at the last meeting that there will be no rate cuts this year. So why is the market pricing in rate cuts? I think the market is indulging in a little bit of wishful thinking. I think that what we've seen with respect to the banks has obviously spooked an awful lot of people. And the bigger question now is, you know, how quickly does the market overshoot to the downside? Because what we've seen is it overshot to the upside on the two-year yield. And I think potentially it's overshooting to the downside um, when it comes to the pricing in of rate cuts. Why would the Fed cut rates um, when headline inflation is at 6%? Core inflation is 5.5 and core PCE is at 4.6%. And core PCE is the Fed's key um, inflation targeting measure. So that's the big question. Um, so let's look at some of the key levels when it comes to the markets. Quite a bit to mull over. I'm doubtful that we'll see a significant reaction. And even if we do, I struggle to come up with a premise which suggests that we will see the S&P 500 take out the highs that we saw in February. Currently, it's finding a little bit of a top around about 41.50. We are, we're, you know, we're 50 to 60 points away from that. I'm not expecting to see a significant move one way or the other today. I think the big reaction, once we get these payrolls numbers out of the way, will shift to CPI on Wednesday next week. And let's not forget, we also had Fed minutes, the release of Fed minutes next week as well. So you might get a little bit of short term volatility today, but I don't think the, the moves are going to be particularly instructive when it comes to the overall direction going forward. What I do say, and I notice you've asked me about dollar yen um, on the first question here, I still favor dollar yen lower. Why? Because at some point, I think the Japanese, the new Japanese central bank uh, governor, Ueda, will, will sig signal that he's shifting on yield curve control. That's not really priced in at the moment. I think there is an expectation that could happen maybe in the summer. Obviously, the first meeting is in April, later this month. So it'll be interesting to see how he sets out his stall when it comes to monetary policy. But in terms of quickly get this chart in, because I've just noticed I'm talking from, we're four minutes away. If we look at dollar yen here, this cloud is currently capping the upside. Now we, we have seen a nice reaction of 129 and a half. It's gone back to 134. I still favor a move back below 130 towards this trend line here to around about 126, 125. I still think dollar yen will be lower by the end of this year than higher. Let's have a quick look at the NASDAQ before we get cracking. Again, we've got a similar sort of situation here. We've broken to the top side, broken above this 12,850 area. That's now going to act as fairly decent support on any move lower. And obviously we have resistance 13,200. What's interesting about this move is while the NASDAQ has managed to rebound quite strongly so far this year and outperformed the rest of US markets, it did it from close to its October lows. The S&P never got close to its October lows. And an awful lot of this move has been driven by three stocks, NVIDIA, Meta Platforms, and, um, and Tesla, I think. So they're the three best performers. And that's what's really driven the NASDAQ higher. I'm not convinced of the merits of a further upside with respect to US markets, because while I don't think we'll get rate cuts this year, Markets aren't pricing in the prospect of an extended pause. They haven't made that distinction. It's binary. Do we get further rate hikes? If we do, it'll be 25 basis points. If we get a disappointing jobs report, we may get a pause in May. And then rates are likely to stay there for quite some time, potentially towards the end of the year. Markets aren't pricing a pause. They're pricing a binary outcome of a 25 basis point rate hike in May and the potential for a cut in Q3. There is no middle ground. So Q1 stock earning results will have an effect on the dollar. Absolutely. We've got JP Morgan on Friday. I'll cover them after the fact.
but let's just quickly go through what we're expecting for payrolls. So I think anything below 200,000 or close to 200,000, the markets have made up their mind. If they get anything in line with expectations, then you could well see two-year yields start to drop off. Even if we get a beat, we get, may get a bit of a spike in the dollar, but that will potentially be an opportunity to sell the dollar on any, any prospect of a decent number. So 3.6% on wages, 4.3% uh, we're expecting average hourly earnings to slip from 4.6% to 4.3%. Also be paying particular attention to the participation rate which rose to its highest levels um, since the pandemic at 62.5%. Just a reminder that it was at 63.4% um, in February 2020. So an awful lot, so there, are, there is evidence that people are returning to the workforce. Anyway, the numbers are now due to hit the tape right now. And here they come. 236, so pretty much in line with expectations. Are there any revisions? I'm not sure that there are. Um, 180, 0.3, 4.2. So wages have come in lower, 4.6 to 4.2, but a participation rate has gone up to 62.6. So more people are returning to the workforce. And what else am I seeing here? And the unemployment rate has dropped to 3.5 percent so all in all um there's some good in that and there's some not well i say there's this nothing particularly um there's nothing particularly that stands out in those numbers so let's just dissect them let's see what's happening with euro dollar we talked about that a little bit so getting a little bit of a push push down which you would expect on the back of the fall in the unemployment rate. But what's interesting is that we held that trend line from these lows through here. So we've got your a bit of a spike in the dollar. Let's have a quick look at what the two-year yield's doing. All right, two-year yield has just jumped 11 basis points. So it was around about 382. It's now 394. Let me just show that to you. Let's bring it over. So pre-payrolls, payrolls. So fairly, fairly positive. Dollar up, but I think by any stretch of the imagination, a positive payrolls report, positive for the dollar. But by the time we get the numbers next week, people will suddenly realise that they still like the narrative of the potential for a little bit of a Fed rate cut later in the year. But given the, given the low levels of liquidity that we're seeing at the moment, we're probably likely to see a potentially outsized move as a consequence of these numbers, which by and large are fairly decent. Um, right. Someone's asked me about ASX 200 moves. <laughs> right. Let's try and make, let's, let's try and keep, let's just keep an eye on that trend line in Euro dollar, see whether or not that holds. But let's quickly look at ASX 200 for you, Thomas. Let me see if I can just find it. There it is. Okay. Right. Well, again, got a little bit. There's really not much in that. This is actually quite interesting. You could argue this is a left shoulder ahead and a right shoulder. Weren't expecting to get this rebound here. But certainly I think if you're worried about the trajectory of the global economy and particularly GDP growth, and obviously those, those um, forecasts from the IMF yesterday, um, then the ASX 200 is likely to feel the draft a little bit in terms of that um obviously there's a china reopening story that you need to play into there and the chinese economy we've got china trade numbers next week so it'll be interesting to see what their import and export data looks like but as far as the asx 200 is concerned 
Next, next key resistance is really those March peaks. Hasn't been able to regain them. The FTSE 100 hasn't been able to regain its March peaks either. And I would argue to a certain extent, the ASX and the FTSE do correlate, probably not as much as um, other indexes, but they, they, they do correlate fairly well. So I think for me, if, if, we, if we can get back above those March peaks, then we could well see a re return to the highs that we saw um, back earlier this year. Because if, if you look at the FTSE 100, it's not quite the same, but obviously you've got a quite a heavy basic resource component in the FTSE 100, you've got a high energy component in the FTSE 100. Um, and we did see a fairly decent rebound on Friday, which could well translate into further gains. And to be quite honest, I'm fairly constructive on the FTSE. And it's interesting to see the DAX and uh, the CAC 40 managed to re recover all of their March losses. We're now back where we were um, at the beginning of March, as far as those indices are concerned. So for me, I'm probably more constructive on European markets than I am US, which have much richer valuations. So I hope I knew you would be confused. Yeah, no, I am a little bit, but I think you can draw a fairly cl close comparison between the FTSE 100 and the ASX 200 in that regard. And for me, I'm quite com I'm quite constructive on the FTSE, so that would lead me, given, the, I mean, it is a fairly tenuous correlation. You would expect to be you would expect to be similarly um, constructive on the ASX 200 given the fact that obviously the RBA has signaled a pause. So that could well augur fairly well for Australia's banks as well. Anyway, um, has anyone got any questions on those numbers? As I say, we've seen a bit of a spike up in two-year yields on the back of those numbers. Fairly, you know, They're fairly positive, but they're only positive until we get the next set of numbers, which is basically on Wednesday when we get the US CPI for March, and obviously we get the Fed minutes. Um, and I, I actually, I want to talk about the Fed minutes to a certain extent, because I think they could shine a light on the Fed's deliberations and discussions when they raise rates by 25 basis points, because there was some speculation amongst some um, people in the uh, financial markets community that they might cut rates which I always thought was wishful thinking. But despite the turmoil rippling through US banking in March, the Fed did indeed go ahead with a 25 basis point rate hike. The, st the tone of the statement was interesting because it came across as much more dovish with the removal of the reference to ongoing increases will be appropriate. And it changed that with some additional policy firming may be appropriate. So a little bit of wriggle room there. Um, I think it's also going to be particularly interesting as to whether or not there was a serious discussion as to whether or not there should be a pause in Fed rates in March and whether in going down that route it may have sent a signal to the market that the Fed was more concerned about the current situation than markets would have liked. Powell did admit that a rate, rate pause was considered However, the challenge for the Fed would always have been how to present that without spooking the markets even more. Now, he did go on to say the prospect of rate cuts this year was not being considered, which some are still touting and pricing as an option. A cursory analysis of the latest dot plot chart confirms that Fed officials were not considering cutting rates, even as markets are continuing to price that possibility. So I would expect the minutes to focus on the uncertainty around recent events, while, out, while also you know, finding out how serious a discussion was had about a pause or the potential for a cut. So they could be interesting, but before that, we've got US CPI for March. Um, that's been coming down steadily. It's expected to come down again from 6% in February to 5.2%. But look at core. Core is what the markets are currently focusing on. And that's expected to go from 5.5 to 5.6. So what's, what's my opinion on the Fed terminal rate? 
I think we're pretty close to it. I think we could get another 25 basis points. It's 4.75 to 5% at the moment. I think at a pinch, because it's May the 3rd, so it's before the next payrolls report, and it's before um, the next CPI report. So today's payrolls report and next week's CPI report could play a key role in determining whether or not we get 25 basis points in May. I think today's payrolls report keeps that on the table. So for me, the terminal rate is another 25 basis points. So another 25 basis points based on today's payrolls report, but that still doesn't mean that the, the market won't start to price a cut in Q3, which is what the current consensus appears to be. Again, I don't buy that. It really depends on how quickly headline inflation comes down. So my terminal rate, Tom, is 5 to 5.25. So another 25 basis points. Um, OK. Um, I got asked about WTI and gold and basically never got around to answering that question. And the person who asked it has left. So that's a bit. I'll, I'll come to that in a minute. Um, what else? ECB terminal rate. Yeah, I mean, that's the big question. The market for me doesn't seem to think that the ECB will be able to hike by more than at least another 50 basis points. Certainly when you look at headline inflation, I still think they've got another 50 in them. Um, but a bigger question for me is um, how do they manage any potential stresses in um, the weaker parts of the banking system in Europe. Um, I, I certainly think another 50 basis points is on the card. I think the Bank of England has got another 25. I think the Bank of England will do another 25. So another 50 from the ECB, another 25 from the Bank of England, and another 25 from the Fed. So that's, that's my terminal rates um, in summary. Let me just quickly make sure I haven't forgotten any other questions uh, da, 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 da. okay okay just excuse the silence while i just make sure copper okay copper here we go someone did ask me about that well there's your line on the copper coming in from those peaks back in march it does, I mean, copper Copper is basically triangulating. It's trading in a sideways sideways move through here. I can probably draw a line through this. It's trading sideways. At the moment, I really don't think that we're going anywhere fast. There's fairly decent support in and around those March lows. But what's interesting about this is that we, I still think in a very long, to, on a longer time frame, we'll probably go higher. But for the time being, we're trading in a tighter and tighter channel. And I think that's probably going to be the way of it. We'll probably find support in the 200 day moving average if we break lower. At the moment, we're struggling anywhere close to 420. There's not really that much to see here. I have a slightly stronger view on crude oil, obviously on the back of um, those OPEC cuts that we saw earlier, the, earlier this week. What's quite interesting about this is that we haven't really conclusively broken out of those series of peaks that I've drawn through the highs from this year. Yeah, we've broken above the 50 day moving average. But for me, I think that demand is probably not going to be anywhere near as strong as perhaps people think it will be. You know, and that sort of ties in with a slightly slower rate of growth going forward. I think if prices go too high, and I think this is where OPEC may have dropped the ball a little bit, is if they go too high, you're going to get demand destruction. And certainly looking at the price action over the course of this week, yeah, we've gone higher, but we haven't really taken out the peaks that we saw back in March. I mean, we haven't really done anything um, in the short term. And maybe that's as a consequence of the fact that we're leading up to Easter and people really don't have an awful lot of interest. But for me, I'm not, you know, I, I can't buy into the narrative of a hundred dollar oil price. I really can't because if oil goes to a hundred dollars a barrel, that is going to trigger potentially demand destruction. Um, looking at, again, US 
oil prices again. Look through the peaks through here. We haven't taken out the peaks. Now, you know, if there was a dynamic for a strong break higher in oil prices, we should have taken those peaks out. We haven't. So for me, I'm still very much play the range on oil, um, play it from the short side anywhere near these peaks here. I've got the 200 day moving average there acting as resistance and we've got resistance there. So it's going to be tough, I think, for oil to go significantly higher on a technical basis from currently where we are at the moment. So, you know, hopefully that helps um, in that regard. Uh, US natural gas, UK natural gas or EU TTF, natural, I know what it's natural gas for the US. I mean, <laughs> Again, we're heading into summer season now, so for me, the line of release resistance for natural gas is lower because generally in the northern hemisphere, demand drops off quite significantly. And you're certainly seeing that in the US natural gas price. You're seeing it in the UK and you're seeing it in, the, in, in Europe as well. So in terms of natural gas, it's difficult to see much upside in the short term. Also, it's important to remember the inventory levels particularly in Europe, are still very, very high. So demand for natural gas is probably not going to pick up much before Q3 um, of this year. So for me, the dynamics, the, the demand dynamics for natural gas aren't in its favour at the moment. So I'm of the opinion that natural gas is hopefully likely to drift lower um, over the course of the next few months. Um, gold. Now, gold's a, gold's a tricky one because obviously we're back above $2,000 an ounce. But again, you know, I still think we can, I still think we can revisit the highs, just not today. Obviously, I'm looking at US two year yields and now they're back down again. They're around about eight basis, eight basis points higher. They were 12. So we're getting a little bit of softening as we head into the end of the day or, or the end of the, um, as, as markets come to close. But for gold prices, I mean, I think if you're starting to signal a pause in rates as opposed to cuts, then gold may struggle to get much above its previous highs. We've seen a little bit of a pullback in the past couple of days. I'll be very interested to see whether or not it can sustain the moves above $2,000 an ounce. If it can't, then we could well see a drift back down to 1940. Um, but the big level really for me on gold is, is the previous record highs that we saw. Uh, back in March and just before that, 2075 here. So you've got a big top in August 2020. We've got a big top there. You're going to need something significant in terms of rate cuts um, for, I think, gold to break to the upside. And I don't think the market's quite there yet when it comes to that expectation for the um, gold price. Silver. It's interesting that it's done fairly, something fairly similar to gold in terms it's broken out through the previous highs, but it hasn't at the moment it's struggling to move much higher. But what is interesting, I think, here is we've tried to get back below $24.50, um, but we've closed well off that support level. So I think unless it can make new highs very, very quickly over the course of the next few sessions, then we could well see it start to roll over and head back towards $24. At the moment, it looks very overbought, getting a little bit of divergence. At the moment, we need to see it break back below this, this previous peak here, which is now acting as support in the short to medium term. So the move higher hasn't been as impulsive as I would like, you know, and unless we can actually get a move higher in the short, from the previous highs of earlier this week, then we could start to run out of a little bit of steam. But again, it's it's a dollar strength story, that one. Um, let me have a quick back look here. Da, 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 da. Okay, dollar yen. Okay, before I wrap this up, guys, and um, get to enjoy the rest of my Easter break, um, do you have any other questions? And was anything not clear? Before actually, before I before I wrap up, let me quickly preview next week we talked about the fed minutes we talked about us cpi we've also got uk february gdp that's going to be interesting given how the pound has performed fairly well over the course of the last few days but we've also got us bank earnings 
Um, JP Morgan Chase, Citigroup and Wells Fargo on Friday. My key takeaway, I think, from the bank earnings numbers when they come out, and we've also got First Republic Bank, they are due to report their numbers on the 13th. Now, they could get pulled, given the problems that First Republic Bank have had over the course of the past month or so. But it'll be interesting to see what First Republic Bank's numbers tell us, um, deposit outflows and what have you. How well have the US, the big banks, the big US banks, um, benefited from deposit inflow? Q, Q1 numbers should tell us that. For me also, I think it'll be very interesting, I think, with respect to US banks, what they tell us about the outlook for loan demand, um, business confidence, deposits inflows, provisions for non-performing loans. All of these will be very key areas that I'll be looking for when it comes to JP Morgan, Citigroup, and Wells Fargo, and mortgage demand as well. Um, on, le on home lending at the last set of numbers, Wells Fargo, um, this was lower by 57% in Q4 due to higher interest rates and a more challenging housing market. Worsening evidence of a worsening outlook on consumer credit, delinquency rates had started to edge higher in Q4 for Wells Fargo, and write-offs rose to $525 million. Wells Fargo set aside $957 million in respect of additional provisions in Q4. JP Morgan set aside $1.4 billion in respect of loan loss provisions in Q4. So all of those will be key areas next week um, when it comes to um, earnings. And we've also got Tesco's full year numbers as well. So it's going to be a fairly busy week. Um, I'm back at my desk on Wednesday. I'm taking Tuesday off, given the fact that um, I've been working on my bank holiday. But otherwise, um, that's um, that's um, that's pretty much it, I think, for this week uh, on this month for the, for the payrolls report. Hopefully, we have, an, have another interesting discussion um, when we come and look at the April payrolls report um, at the beginning of May. I think it's in and around the 7th of May. Otherwise, I'd like to thank you all for your company today. Hope you all have a happy Easter and um, I'll speak to you all same time, same place um, next month. Thank you.